So today we are very lucky to be in the presence of a South African legend, um, played multiple games for the national team at all levels, played all through South Africa at some of the biggest clubs, Sundowns, Wits University, Ajax Cape Town, Cape Town Spurs, and then eventually moved into Europe and then back to South Africa. Today we Ooh. welcome Mr. Ooh. Matthew Booth. Ooh. Thank you. Uh, cheers, gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation. Pleasure to have you on. It's, it's, do, you uh, still, do, do you still get goose pimples when we go, Booth? No, I, I, I don't, to be honest, but I, I, I always have a good chuckle because I remember having to explain that to the, the hundreds of foreign journalists that uh, descended on South Africa during that time. And just explaining that. The, the fans were not booing me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember there was a front page in Spain that said that the racist South African fans were booing the one white player on the field during the Confed Cup. And if anything, it was a term of endearment. We loved you. We still do. Yeah, yeah it's, it's um, the Italian, Italian journalists and Spanish journalists. Uh, ju it was a kind of a knee-jerk reaction because they had during that that period coming for some stick themselves uh, you know in their domestic leagues yeah for um racial in incidences so without checking their facts or even asking me they just jumped the gun really and uh yeah it was, it was quite humorous but also quite worrying at the same time <laughs> <laughs> oh that, that's great so matthew listen where are you in south africa and what are you currently doing yeah, so um, I'm in Johannesburg, um, and uh, I retired, uh, what, six or seven years ago, um, and I'm doing a bit of punditry work uh, for, for super sports, um, and I'm also involved in, artif in the artificial grass uh, industry. Um, I'm on, on a couple of uh, disciplinary committee panels, um, which is a little bit ironic because I used to sit on the other side of the table more often than not. Um, for the South African Institute for Drug-Free Sports. Those are the guys that test our athletes. And for the Premier Soccer League um, DC uh, rotating panel. Um, and then I'm, uh, so I'm involved in a couple of um, uh, NGOs, um, the Booth Educational Sports Trust and the South African Football Legends. So yeah, that's, that's what's keeping me out of trouble. <laughs> yeah, you sound very busy. But I want, I want to touch on the artificial grass project what can you expand for our viewers because i've seen it on your twitter feed um what what is it about what are you doing with that project yeah so it's um i basically do some consultancy consultancy work for uh, a company here in johannesburg and uh we basically uh, install and give advice to um you know community schools um etc who have the capital to to put in these fields. Um, I've been fascinated with artificial grass since 2009 when I attended a, um, a seminar held by, hosted by FIFA um, with the realization that in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, first of all, it's obviously a water scarce uh, region. Uh, we've had some scares here in South Africa uh, recently. Um, and also from a developmental point of view, um, you know, to be able to play on a flat surface um it, it's you know those opportunities are few and far between i'm sure you know courtney you know um you know growing up we used to play on fields which you you had to be you had to have very quick feet and a lot of energy all the time otherwise to prepare for that ball to perhaps hit you in the throat you know <laughs> you know because we hardly ever played on a on a nice lush uh, flat turf um so for for young kids to be able to learn their technique with confidence on a flat surface, nice green flat surface, is going to be great for, for South Africa. I, I, Matthew, what I'd like to do, I'd like to bring it back to your career. I'd like to look at football now. Let's us just move forward here. Yeah? You've had such an illustrious career in the game. As I said, you've played close to 500 games, represented the national team at multiple levels, which is not an easy thing to do. Where did it all start for somebody like you? Yes, yeah, so I grew up in a place called Fishhook on the peninsula, um, uh, you know, in, in of Cape Town. Um, my uh, father and his three brothers um, 
were all footballers. I think my uncle played a couple of games for Hellenic professionally, but generally they were good amateur uh, footballers. Although I often get stopped in the street and asked if I'm related to my dad or my uncles. And um, I'll first ask them uh, why. <laughs> why. Why do you want to know? Because they, they had this reputation of being uh, brawlers on the field as well. You know? So they were, they were rough and tough and had a bit of a reputation in that regard. But um, my dad always spent a lot of extra time with me uh, going down to the fields and, and practicing, you know, training my left foot and uh, doing a lot of headers. And, you know, I, I always appreciated that. Um, I don't think many parents these days have the time to, to do that. Um, so I was rather fortunate. And we used to train every Tuesday and every Thursday at Fishhook AFC, which was established in 1930. Very well established amateur club which is still going strong, which services that valley, um, has a strong sense of volunteerism still, which is again, few and far between, unfortunately, uh, in this day and age. And, um, you know, in the, in the eighties, I was playing with, um, you know, young color kids from Ocean View, yeah. uh, because like I said, before we went on, on to record, um, football was, was always a very progressive um, sport and industry. And all of the officials involved were, were staunch anti-apartheid activists and were thumbed their noses at the authorities to some extent. So that assimilated me at a, at a very young age, um, which again was rather fortunate. And I played for Fisher from when I was five until 17 and um, then got spotted at the very prestigious uh, youth uh, tournament called the Bay Hill Tournament in Cape Town. Um, and I was spotted by Cape Town Spurs. Uh, the coach was Mish de Avery at the time. And that's how basically I got into uh, professional football. And I, I remember, Matthew, as, and you and I have spoken about this uh, earlier on, um, myself, when I made my debut for Manning Rangers, it was actually against you at uh, Cape Town Spurs. And I just remember Gordon in the change room before the game saying, they've got this very tall guy at the back so we're going to have to keep it on the ground because he's going to win all the headers out there. And to be honest, I'd never seen you. And then when we got out there, six foot six, I just couldn't believe we, we had no chance because our game was designed around crosses and yep. headers. George Kumanti Rakas, as you know, we won the Premier League that way. Uh, and, and I just didn't think it would work that way with you being there. Yeah, I had a... Um... You know, I quite enjoyed the tussle um, against strikers of Georgia's nature. Um, what I didn't like was the shorter center of gravity, uh, quicker strikers, um, you know, especially when I gave them space and they started to run at me. Um, so I learned very quickly to try and negate that and to, to give my, to, anticip to anticipate the ball in behind and also to just to get very quickly up on, a, on the back of a striker to make sure he doesn't turn. That was something that I had to learn uh, very early on. But I, I remember that Manning Rangers team, um, quality team, had some hell of a players um, uh, in that squad. And um, yeah, Gordon is a, is, a, is a legendary coach who's won everything they used to win them. Yeah. Now, just looking at, as I said, you, you, you've got such a long career in the game. We... In South Africa, when you played, were you at your most happiest as a player? You felt, you know, I'm really doing well and the manager's getting the best out of me. You know, those first two years at, at Cape Town Spurs, um, I was playing for the under-19s and I was able to train with their senior team. And I was, I was, I had stars in my eyes because I was, I was playing, I was playing alongside or training alongside guys like Sean Bartlett, Ronnie Zondi, David Modise, you know, um, and they, they went on to actually win the title, win the league in 95, uh, but then it got taken away from them. And then the following year to win the double. And I was training with these guys, you know, um, under Mish de Avery. So I was, I was probably at my happiest then um, as a young, young player coming into the industry. Um, but I think, when I matured, um, my three, my first initial three years at Sundowns was also with a, an incredibly talented uh, squad who had won two leagues in a row, 
I joined them for their third uh, win. Uh, we also won the double. And again, the types of players that I was playing with um, creates um, an incredibly happy environment, um, but also very fulfilling. And there's a big difference in that regard um, because I knew that I was progressing. Um, and, you know, you don't, as a, as a player, as a, as a parent with young kids, you know, you don't want, you don't want perfection, but you, you want progression in life. Uh, you want to see an improvement. And that's what I was seeing uh, within myself. So I was, I was also happy then. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. You moved to Sundowns. They made you captain very soon after getting there. Am I correct? Did you captain them as well? Not, not, not in that particular stint, no. Um, mm. There were just too many um, more experienced players. Uh, Daniel Mambush Mudao uh, was the captain during that stint. Um, and then I think I did get the captaincy uh, when I returned from Russia for a further three seasons. Um, but those three seasons, uh, are, I've tried my best to quickly forget about those three seasons because uh, <laughs> we, did, we didn't win anything. So that wasn't very joyful. <laughs> Well, I, I just remember your move to Sundowns and, and not many people moved from Cape Town to Pretoria during that period. Um, and you were one of the first moves and it all looked like it was going well. Sundowns were doing well. But I'm going to fast forward to a period. You come back from Russia. You only play one season at Sundowns. W what happened there? Yeah, so I, I actually played... There was. It was actually three seasons. Uh, I played six um, seasons altogether for Sundowns. But on my return from Russia, um, the reason why I joined the Sundowns was to to win things. I hadn't. I didn't feel that I had won enough um, titles. And Sundowns were the wealthiest club then. They they still are here in South Africa. And I expected to win things on my return. Um, unfortunately, the president. Um, had a strange transfer policy and uh, during my three years there on return um, I had players arrive after me and leave before me um, during the January transfer window uh, at one stage there were 14 new signings and, and yeah yeah it was quite ridiculous um, half a team the, exactly the, the turnover was just too uh, too much, um, and you you know as well as I do, you know footballers love consistency. I want to play with a centre back um, as regularly as possible. Mm. I, I want uh, the starting eleven to be as regular as possible, and it just caused too much uh, confusion and and ructions within the squad. Um, I mean, we had the best squad uh, every season of those three seasons, but. It just kept on changing every every six months. Um, uh, you know, you, I think you've interviewed, you've mentioned that you've inter interviewed Pizzo before. And, yes. and once Pizzo came on board, what he did was, because he had a personal relationship with Patrice Motsepe, the owner, he was able to sit down with Patrice and say, look, your transfer system is, is ridiculous. Um, please give me the power of your 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 signings your play your comings and goings and lo and behold very quickly he was able to produce a very consistent squad and he started to win things for sundowns yeah you know, it's not a it's not rocket science uh, science so unfortunately those those last three seasons at sundowns were very disappointing for those reasons yeah. so interesting hearing that perspective matthew um so you would say really the success in the years that Sundowns built their dynasty, right? Five of the last seven years they've won the title is really down to the fact that Patrice handed over the signing and running of the football side to somebody like Pizzo? Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know, they were, I, I felt at, at, at some stage there were guys that were taking advantage of Patrice and creating a, a, almost a secondary economy on the side uh, when it came to signing players because of course there's agents there's technical directors there's perhaps sometimes money under the table um, whenever a player comes in and that's why at that stage very few of the uh, youth products actually were able to come through 
into the squad because that secondary economy is not able to be maintained if you go through a, a, a youth um, a policy. Um, so they had a signings-based policy um, and that didn't do us any good. Um, and yeah, I think Pizzo came in and stabilized the situation and um, you know that that's why they were so well, that's why they have been so successful uh, of late. When you talk about the secondary economy, Matthew, there'll be listeners all over the continent who might not be aware what that means. Um, this is a safe space. We want you to feel comfortable. We're around the braai, Um, and we're not here to get any sensationalist headlines. So this is a conversation. But if you were to explain that to somebody in Cameroon or somebody in Zambia, how would you explain uh, that concept? Well, I think, um... You know, there's too many gatekeepers in our game. Um, everything goes well at amateur level, you know, because there's no money involved. Uh, people generally progress naturally. Uh, but as soon as there's money involved, things start to get skewed. Um, and so agents, not all agents, because there are some very good ones, very honest ones. Um, but agents, uh, technical directors, sometimes even club owners, uh, coaches I know of here locally who will, for example, uh, insist on a player giving them 10% of their um, their package for a place for a regular place in the starting line. Um, sometimes it will be bonuses. Um, that's unfortunately I've heard far too many stories for it not to be true. <laughs> um, so that's what I mean by secondary economy. Um, when it comes to signings, uh, perhaps an agent will um, have to pay a particular person within a club to make sure that the signing goes through. Um, again, that's a secondary, that's part of the secondary economy, uh, which is, in my opinion, unlawful. It's, it's, it's unlawful. Um, you, you, you're not only uh, stealing money from the player, but you're indirectly stealing money from the club as well. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's, that's how I would sum it up. Yeah. yeah, sure. One final question on that before I hand back to Courtney. But um, in South Africa, we know that some of the best players in the country earn about 13,000 US dollars a month, which is a fantastic salary when playing in Africa. We know that the Premier Soccer League is the richest league on the continent. And teams like um, Sundowns, who have uh, Patrice Motsepe, who's invested his money in there, Chiefs and Orlando Pirates uh, with uh, their fantastic fan bases and commercial revenue are some of the wealthiest clubs on the continent and in the world. And there are many people out there who will be sitting there going, wow, we, in South Africa, we've got such an advanced football economy. We can't believe that this is something that is still going on. Would you, would you say that this is still common practice today? Um, yeah, it's difficult to say. Probably not uh, so much uh, in the top league, but I know it is. It does happen uh, in in our second tier. Um, I, I've I've heard of more stories emanating from that tier. Um, but yeah, South Africa is very top heavy. You know, um, our Premier Soccer League is probably the wealthiest in the in the probably the top 15, top 10 in the world when it comes to wealth. Um, and our, our grassroots football um, is, is very poor. Um, if, you, if you go out of our metros, out of our big cities, uh, there's hardly any organized football. Um, and our football has become very centralized. So everybody tends to come to Johannesburg, you know, um, which is not healthy. Um, so that's what I mean about top heavy as well. Um, I think our, our money, our cash at the top has to start to, to trickle down um, more, more, you know, further down, down to the levels, uh, grassroots levels, LFA. Um, I think we have too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Uh, everybody wants to be a chairman of a club. Um, and I think, yeah, there's a whole multitude of different elements. Uh, you know, I'm rambling on a little bit here, but <laughs> uh, there's so many different 
there's so many issues with our football that needs to be fixed. Um, but I feel that we should stop looking and focusing on Bafana Bafana and the Premier Soccer League. We should start to roll up our sleeves and do a little bit more work uh, at grassroots level. Yeah. Which then allow for projects like what you are currently involved in to be expanded more across the country, uh, which then also then starts to increase those very low percentages of children being involved in sport if that money does trickle down to the lower grassroots levels of football. That, that, that is, um, I would 100% agree with that. Um, and, and sometimes it's just about getting the right people involved in the sport and who stop, like, as you said, Pizzo put a stop to this almost wasteful spending at the top level, which wasn't needed. Yeah, you hit the nail uh, on the head. Uh, we, we've, we've got to get people in the game who um, have the game at heart. Yeah. Um, and, and it's very difficult when you have that pot of gold, you know, at, at the premier, at the top. Um, and, and it's amazing how a lot of our amateur clubs, our well-established amateur clubs are becoming more and more professionalized as well, with parents having to pay more and more money each year. Um, and I'm talking about uh, clubs in, in, in our metros, in our urban areas, you can perhaps uh, afford it. And that, that, that should be a, a bit of a warning signal for us um, because ultimately you're bound to attract people who don't have the game at heart, even at that level. Um, so that, that's a cautionary uh, tale there as well. Matthew, you and I were just, just following on from this, uh, and we talk, you're still staying on finances. We were speaking a bit earlier about being in the game for long. A footballer's career, we think at the time, is long, which it's not. It's maybe 15 years or more max, if you really look after yourself as well. But you were talking about financial advice, which uh, I found very interesting. Do you want to just touch on that a bit more? Yeah, so uh, here, here and in Europe, um, the stats are quite frightening. 75% uh, of, of ex-footballers, five years after retirement, will be divorced, bankrupt, or drug or alcohol dependent, um, which is, you know, five years after retirement. You know, generally here in South Africa, a, a player will, will retire and then immediately start eating into his savings. Um, which obviously is unhealthy. You know, we've we've got to start to learn to prepare for the for what I call the afterlife. Um, as soon as you sign your first professional contract, um, you know, it, it's it's almost like that um, game of two halves. You know, where a coach um, after a game will 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 mention that often that cliche. You know, it was a game of two halves. Well, footballers' lives are very similar to that. You know, you have your your glorious first half where you are uh, in your prime, you know, uh, six pack, um, you know, you've got a number of uh, <laughs> girlfriends, uh, you're driving the latest car um, or cars in some instances. Um, Matthew, then, can I come in really quickly? <laughs> can I live through you vicarious? Never had a six pack, <laughs> never had a professional career, never had a cab. Hey, I'm Lysia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the part where you're going to change your mind. Those are all <laughs> trappings, they, they <laughs> trapping. <laughs> okay, well, well, explain to me the trappings now. <laughs> and and so we we don't prepare. We don't prepare for that second half. Um, and all of that gets taken away from you. So you don't have a strict uh, training regimen anymore. What do you do? Uh, your wife or, or partner starts looking at you differently because uh, your bum is starting to get soft now. You know, you're starting to grow a bit of a stomach, maybe. Um, uh, the journalists are not phoning you. You're not on television anymore. Um, so, you know, psychologically, we have got a lot to deal with in that regard. And, and it's no surprise that a lot of footballers suffer from depression um, and they start drinking more. Um, you know, antisocial behavior comes into play and uh, we don't prepare ourselves. And it's partly because of the glamour that is that sucks us into the game. Um, we, we try to live up to, the, to our own 
um, sort of status uh, or standards that we set for ourselves when it comes to being a professional football player, but also our community doesn't help as well because they, they expect us to behave in a particular manner as well. Um, and we've got to try and push against that, you know. Um, I think it will also help that if in the changing room, the players, you know, it's a very macho place to be. Um, and I think talking about the latest car that you bought or how many girls you took home the previous night, I think that's got to be replaced by um, what book you're reading or what startup um, uh, you're interested or what you're studying. You know, if we can try and change the talk in the change room or the team bus, I think that will also help the situation that we've put ourselves in. We can't keep on blaming clubs and the association for our failures. Uh, ultimately, we have to realize that clubs are, are run by businessmen. Businessmen are only uh, concerned with one thing, and that's when you can offer them a service. Once that service is not available anymore, they don't really care about you. So we've got to come to that conclusion um, and, and take the responsibility ourselves of looking after our finances um, in a mature uh, fashion. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I see a change though, uh, on a positive note, I see um, the more intelligent uh, teams, um, and you can see an intelligent team when they perform on the field, uh, they have intelligent personalities, players who who are starting to change the the industry for for the good. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not quick enough for me um, because you're still hearing of of players even in this day and age who have been earning um, 200 and 300 thousand uh, rand uh, a month who no. who have fought on, on on hard times. You know, well uh -oh. the range the range in the Premier Soccer League, uh, Courtney is is um, is a couple of thousand rand to 300, 350,000 rand a month. Um, so it's a very big range. Um, but yeah, there is a handful of players who, who are earning that sort of money. Um, and that's why uh, very few of our uh, professionals in the Premier Soccer League, when they do get an opportunity to go to Turkey or to Greece or to Russia, they'll decline it because um, they're quite happy to stay in, in, in the Premier Soccer League. Uh, play in South Africa locally, um, and I and I encourage youngsters or any pro that gets an opportunity to go to Europe to go, even if you're going to earn less money, because ultimately you turn out to be to be to become a better product. You learn a new language, you learn a new culture, um, you go back to a cold apartment, perhaps injured by yourself. Uh, it, it strengthens character. Um, but yeah, not, not many of them have taken that opportunity, unfortunately. But there is a nice group of young South Africans who have gone over when they're 13, 14, 15 to Europe already. And you're starting to see them pop up in the likes of Portugal, England, you know, which is uh, Belgium, uh, which is quite refreshing as long as Bafana Bafana claim, claim them very quickly and don't uh, allow them to play for any other nation. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know Courtney's going to come in here, but for our viewers on the content and around the world listening, you don't have to get your calculator out. 300,000 Rand, that's equivalent to just under 20,000 US dollars. So that'll give you a sense on what a South African top flight player can earn in our Premier Soccer League. That's about 20,000 US dollars a month, which is something not to be sniffed at at all. Absolutely. Absolutely not. But Matthew, you touched on something quite important there. You encourage youngsters to go into other leagues uh, in Europe and experience, which is what you have done. Uh, you moved to Russia. Uh, you, you played in Russia for two teams. Do you want to talk more about that experience and how was it for you during a time when not many people in South Africa were taking that jump? Yeah, so, you know, I tried my best to play in more well-established leagues. Um, I think the closest I got was a trial to West Ham uh, in 2001. Harry Redknapp uh, had a very good week at West Ham. They were selling Rio Ferdinand to Leeds um, and they were needing a centre-back. Um, apparently, Redknapp was, was happy with my performance, but unfortunately, Sundowns asked for uh, £1.5 million pounds at the time. 2001, I had played a couple of seasons in South Africa, only had a handful of Bafana caps, you know, B-grade Bafana caps. So 
1.5 million pounds was just a ridiculous uh, sum, uh, which West Ham was never going to take up, you know. So that fell through. Um, and then it came to a point where I decided, well, you know, I've got to start earning some foreign currency. I became a little bit more mercenary in my attitude. Um, and the Russian opportunity came up. Uh, we were being coached by Viktor Bondarenko at Sundowns, who came from Rostov in Russia. And the team was struggling in the relegation zone. And myself and uh, Keith Kampamba, a Zambian international, went uh, over to Rostov. Um, I knew very little about the country, about the league at the time. Um, we were able to save the team from, from relegation. Uh, and I spent two years at Rostov, a further four years at Krylia Sovietov in the top flight. And it turned out to be a, actually a good move for me because very similar to the MLS in the, um, in the mid-90s, Russia at that time was spending a lot of their petrodollars on the league and trying to bring in uh, quality players from around Europe and South America. Uh, so I played in a very competitive uh, league against some fantastic players for six seasons um, and learned a language, learned a culture, you know, the history of a, a, a country that you can fit South Africa to. South Africa into you know 14, 15 times, um, and it was it was a fantastic time in my career. I played some of the best football uh, of my career. Unfortunately, though, it was a case of out of sight, out of mind, and I didn't play for my national team during that time. In two thousand and eight, my last season in Russia, I got recalled to Bafana Mafana. But the reason, the only reason why I got recalled was because journalists in South Africa were questioning where I was or why I wasn't in the national team because for the first time South Africa was on the brink of not qualifying for a nation's cup and so it took a, a critical moment in our national team's uh, history for me to be recalled it was almost like a desperation move um, but the one thing that I've learned in my career that you have to be prepared at all times for that moment, for that opportunity. If you're not prepared, you're unlikely to take it. Um, and I made sure that I was prepared and enthusiastic and willing to play for my national team at that time. And the first two friendlies that I played for Bafana on my return, I won man of the matches and established myself back in the national team. Uh, and then went on to play in the Confederations Cup in 2009 and then be part of the uh, 2010 uh, World Cup squad. Matthew, you would have played under Joel Santana in 2009. And uh, <laughs> I see a little laugh there. Go on. <laughs> Tell us a story. You, you can't, that, look, that looks worth I'm a million bucks. I'm waiting for you to continue, please. <laughs> <laughs> and I know we started the interview uh, by talking about... Um, you know, the booing that we saw at the Confed Cup that led to some of the reports in, uh, in Europe. Um, but when we fast forward to 2010 and you're playing under Carlos Alberto Pereira at the World Cup in South Africa, I mean, it's brilliant for so many reasons, right? It's the first World Cup in Africa. It is um, that Shabalala goal, which everybody talks about still now it's like an iconic world cup moment south africa beats france but then like every sword there's the other side where bafana obviously don't progress to the next round if i'm correct matthew you were part of the squad but an unused substitute at that tournament yeah. um and i suppose when you sit back now what we 10 11 years later when you look back at the world cup like what are your lasting impressions what are your memories what are you what is it that you you take away from that experience? Um, well, the, the, the build-up, I think, um, to the World Cup, I had, I had played under Santana in the Confederations Cup, and I spoke about not, not testing myself in a, in a more established league, but at least uh, the Confederations Cup gave me an opportunity to play against Brazil and Spain, who were number one and number two in the world. And I played in all five games uh, in that competition. And I was on a high. Um, and there was a lot of immediate media attention. And the, the turning point came for me when Santana was sacked and uh, Pereira came back to the national team. And I could tell that I was not his favorite. Um, and 
the six months leading up to the World Cup in 2010, from January to June, I was I was desperate to change his mind. Uh, and we went on a number of camps to Brazil, to Germany, within South Africa. I wasn't able to do it. Um, and so I sat on the bench, um, a very cold bench <laughs> in June in South Africa. Uh, and I think the, the standout moment for me was not only the goal, uh, Shabalala's goal, but um, the way that we hosted a, a very successful World Cup as a nation, you know, people I'm not sure don't realize that um, the South African Football Association doesn't get much chance to to organize or to to host. It's uh, it's like a Swiss Army just descends on a on a nation and takes over, you know. Um, but but from a civilian sort of from from a South African population point of view, the way that we welcomed, the way that we hosted, uh, the way that we created that, uh, like a festival of football and, and proved a lot of critics and doubters wrong. Um, I think that that will be my takeaway point, definitely. That, was always, that will always stand out for me. Yeah. Carlos Alberto Verreira comes back. Man's obviously won a World Cup Brazil in 1994. Um, why was it do you think you didn't fit into his um, his strategy or his tactics? What was it? Did you guys ever have a conversation about that? Did he ever explain that? Um, what his philosophy was? How was the communication on that side? Yeah, he, he, he didn't. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, he, he had had a previous stint with South Africa uh, while I was in Russia and he hadn't called me up. Um, so I got a sense that, you know, when he left and Santana came on board, uh, there was that slight crisis. And by default, he kind of brought me back into the squad. I then had the opportunity to establish myself, you know, and cement my place. But then when Santana left and Pereira re re returned, um, not once did we have a sit down and, and explain uh, why. It's, it's, it's kind of, uh, footballers, particularly in South Africa, uh, don't ask why. Um, we have, we have this. We suffer from ageism. Um, in fact, we too, we too respectful of our elders. You know, um, and that's something that we have to change um, because a lot of our politicians get away with uh, things that they shouldn't, and and we don't question enough. We don't we don't hold them responsible responsible enough uh, because they are older than us. Uh, that's that's rubbish. You know that's that's got to change. Yeah? Yeah. And I think I think that was probably the reason why I wasn't more forthright and and approach him because I wasn't quite sure how he was going to respond. Um, but but what I did try to do was that on the training field I would be on time. I would give hundred percent on every occasion. And uh, you try and change his mind in that fashion. With, with Pereira coming in, he was the Bafana coach. Then he returned to Brazil for a period of time for family reasons. And Mr. Santana steps in and then he came back to take uh, the team and the nation to the World Cup. You were involved in the team. Did you ever get the sense that Carlos Alberto Pereira was here because his heart was in the job? Or do you think it was a very much a, I'm a professional and I'm going to do a job and then I'll go wherever I'm needed next. Um, again, you know, I don't want to sound too cynical because uh, it's like, I all sound like I've it's sour grapes, but um, I, I just got the sense that it was like our association needed a high profile coach in charge, you know? Uh, that's what it boiled down to for me. Um, and... <sighs> Whenever foreign coaches arrive on our shores, I don't mind it. Um, as long as they leave something tangible behind. Um, and, you know, that's what I've tried to do as a player as well. When I moved to Russia, you know, I, I, I learned the language. Um, I always had time for the fans because I understood that um, they were in part paying my salary. You know, I, there was, I couldn't be arrogant about it at all. Um, and, and likewise with, with 
coaches who arrive on our shores, uh, you've got to leave something behind. You know, you've got to be, or you've got to stay behind and be and be answerable for your mistakes um, or your decisions or your team selections. Um, obviously, that wasn't the case, and I, you know, I felt that uh, you know, Pizzo perhaps could have done even a better job. Perhaps he would have been able to have uh, moved into the the knockout stages, but but who knows now. Um, but we just have this fixation here locally with uh, foreign coaches, and um, I like the fact that Pizzo has been so successful because there's been a a, a, a young group of, of South African coaches who have followed in his wake, which is uh, very refreshing. Matthew, you you mentioned Pizzo Mosemane. He left the job after he failed to qualify the team for the AFCON. Would you have liked to have seen him stay in that Bafana role for longer? And a follow-up question to that would be, do you think he can still maybe come back to coach Bafana one day? Um, yeah, I, I certainly feel that he should come back to coach the national team because his first stint, uh, I felt, was just bad timing. I think the best coaches in the world often, or the more, or should I say, the, more sac- the most successful coaches in the world uh, get their timing right. Um, they'll keep their ear to the ground and they will watch other squads and how they uh, progress and transform and how they age. Um, and so in that regard, I don't think Pizza got it right uh, in his timing. But, you know, to get an opportunity to coach uh, Pirates, Chiefs, Sundowns or, the, or our national team, I mean, there's not, there's not many that are going to turn it down and say, oh, I'm, I'm not ready. You know, <laughs> no, I'm not ready for it. But I would love to see him back. Um, he's matured and progressed enormously well, um, as everybody knows. Um, and yeah, to answer your question, I, I would love to see him back. Yeah. Is management in the future for you? And where are you going to start? Yeah, so I've, I've quite enjoyed uh, my coaching at um, community level um, through our charities. Uh, getting ex-players involved as well has been very grat- gratifying. Um, you know, there's nothing better than, than watching a young kid actually look you in the eye and take instruction and then go and do it on the field and then see them, see him or her progress as well. Um, that's brilliant. Uh, to answer your question, at the moment, I'm not qualified uh, to coach um, senior football. Um, I've been waiting for a number of years for uh, our local association to roll out um, uh, coaching programs and to, to inform us uh, when and where it will take place. So I've kind of started to look overseas at the uh, UEFA courses, I, unfortunately. Um, I don't feel that I should have to do that, but uh, I, I am having to. Um, and. You know, there are there are probably four or five clubs here locally who I would uh, manage or coach. Um, unfortunately, the vast majority of them are, are run by uh, people or business people who are very impatient. You know, and I can understand that because they're putting their their money into the club. They want success, uh, but unfortunately, football and sport doesn't work like that. Um, you know, it's very similar to education. You can't send uh, your kid to university. You know he's got to go to primary school first. <laughs> I mean, it's as, as, as simple as that. You can't miss any skips uh, in your in the developmental in the developmental processes. And um, you know, building a squad, a successful team, uh, takes time. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of them don't don't have that time or don't want to give you that time. Well to our owners out there in South Africa who are consistently changing uh, managers month in, month out. You've heard it here first. Mr. Matthew Booth is looking for a club to manage, but he's looking for a patient (laughs) owner who understands the game and is willing to invest time, not only money, but time. Um, Matthew, that's, that's, that's a fantastic answer because someone of your experience in South Africa, abroad, 
and some of the difficulties you've had in the game and also the financial side cannot be lost to a brain's trust of management some way. So even if it's not taking a head coach job at this point in time, maybe uh, an assistant or part of a coaching panel somewhere, I really hope you get the opportunity. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's something that I've been thinking more and more about, uh, you know, and, and players uh, who do retire, you know, immediately they think about coaching, but there's so many other um, careers that you can build around a football club, you know, general manager, sports director, CEO, you know, some form of administrator, even our, our, our medical fraternity, you know, we've had a number of players who have gone into medical fraternity and, and qualified to become physios, biokinetists, you name it, you know, so coaching is not the only avenue. Yeah. So Matthew, you've been very gracious with your with your time. I must say, thank you so much. Uh, firstly, just to be able to get you to come onto our podcast was uh, an unbe unbelievable coup for us. And for our viewers out there, uh, go ahead, Zay. You got to do it with me now. One, <laughs> two, three. Oh. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Cheers, gentlemen. Thank you very much, Courtney Z. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks Come great, again. Great you have an open invite to join us around the Bri. Come again. You'll be sorry. You'll be sorry you asked. <laughs> <laughs>